So this is an overview of the most common types of brain tumor. So the most common type for, for what you would know, the most common type of benign brain tumor is a meningioma. So when you think about benign brain tumors, uh, really think about meningioma. Now, majority of meningiomas are grade one. Uh, there's a sub a subset are grade two, and very rarely they are grade three or uh, you know anaplastic. So, but in the in general, we think about meningiomas as a more benign pathology. Uh, benign doesn't mean that it doesn't cause problems. Benign pathologies can cause a significant local mass effect. They can have be very invasive and be major problems, but when we talk about benign and malignant, we're really talking about how aggressive it is and its metastatic potential. For the malignant tumors, the most common type of malignant brain tumor is a, metas is a metastasis. So one, two, and three, almost always what we're seeing are metastatic tumors to the brain. Even though we think a lot about glioblastoma, it's actually much less common than a patient with a metastatic tumor. And that's just by virtue of the numbers of people uh, that have cancer and this number continues to increase. So as the therapies that we have for metastatic cancer continue to improve and our patients fortunately are living longer, we're seeing more and more patients with metastatic disease to the brain, even when they're doing really well otherwise. So that is becoming an increasing uh, patient population that we're addressing. So intraaxial or extraaxial. So for those of you that don't know what, you know, what does it mean to be intraaxial? So this this, um, do we have any, are we able to have any participation or is it's kind of like a closed webinar? Uh, yes, I, I have opened the uh, unmute everyone's microphone so okay. they can participate. Okay, so feel free to ask or jump in if you have any questions. But um, so this is an example of a meningioma. It's very, it's a very um, typical example of a skull based meningioma. We call these types of tumors extra axial because they're actually arising from outside the brain. So these typically arise from the meninges, from the dural covering typically, and they actually push into the brain. So you might say, oh, well, you know, this clearly looks like it's inside the brain. Um, and it is, it's in the cranial vault, but it's not actually inside of the parenchyma of the brain, of the brain substance itself. It's actually growing from the covering of the brain and it's pushing the brain away pushing the normal brain away. And that's what we call an extra axial tumor. In contrast, this is, you know, very typical of, a, of metastatic tumors. So metastatic tumors are, in, are typically intra axial tumors that they arise often at what we call the gray white junction, which is where the gray matter meets the white matter. Uh, and these vessels end in those areas. And we see these metastatic tumors. We call those intra axial tumors because they are actually arising from, you know, within the brain. So even though they, they are an abnormal collection of cells that are pushing brain away, they're actually um, arising from within the brain itself, as opposed to outside of the brain and pushing in. So we're going to focus on cortical tumors. Um, and I, I think you'll talk in probably other sessions about, about skull-based tumors and extraaxial tumors, but we're really going to focus on cortical anatomy, cortical tumors, and cortical lesions that are addressed. So when do we need to take something out? Uh, tumors that are increasing in size, creating mass effect, or creating swelling in the brain, which we call edema, causing new neurologic symptoms or a neurologic deficit, or any tumor that we would expect to be malignant that would benefit from resection. We remove vascular lesions. Uh, AVMs are have a risk of rupture typically of you know up to 5% per year that varies depending on how large it is and where it is. Um, but the given the risk of rupture, depending on the patient's age, we generally advise that those be removed when possible. Uh, and we can talk later about you know which ones can be removed and which ones can't. But in general, you know, AVMs are considered um, surgical lesions or lesions that need to be treated in some way. We remove things that cause neurologic symptoms, such as seizures. So cavernous malformations typically can cause seizures. And they, um, if they're not causing seizures or they're not causing bleeding, they don't necessarily have to be removed. But anything in the brain that isn't normal can cause irritation, cause seizures. If they've resulted in hemorrhage, so cavernous malformations, for example, can bleed. Uh, when they bleed, we typically want to remove it because we want to prevent uh, recurrent bleeding episodes. 
We remove infections when it's an abscess with a really thick or defined wall. And that's because the antibiotics that we give typically don't penetrate this thick wall once it's formed in the abscess. Uh, and it's very tricky to treat CNS infections like that. So most abscesses need to be drained or, or removed. Abscesses or infections that look near the ventricle, near the fluid spaces in the brain, are at risk of rupturing into the ventricle, and that can cause a really severe ventriculitis or meningitis. So you know, those are ones that we pay special attention to in terms of removing and preventing uh, further infection. Inflammatory lesions. So things like MS, you know, those are not neurosurgical lesions. Those are not things that need to be removed. They can even sometimes cause things that look like tumors, but in general, they don't need to, they're not treated surgically. They're treated with medications, um, with immunomodulators, the only times we as surgeons get involved is if we're really not sure what something is and we need to do a biopsy and we take a sample of it. Otherwise, there's typically not a huge role for resection for most inflammatory lesions. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.